coming back. You know, we didn't know if anybody would come back after the first session. We've tried to break it up into five one-hour sessions, and we're talking about different things at each one. Uh, for some of you that weren't here in the first session, we'll spend two or three minutes. We'll go through very quickly what we talked about in the, the first session, and there's some questions that came up at the end of the first session. I'll try to answer those. So again, if you have questions at the end of the night, just give them to Wendy. We'll try to answer every question that you have by the next session. Um, this was what we talked about the first time, the topography you know, of Norfolk. It's the highest point in Wayne County. It's the Switzerland of Wayne County, 1,000 feet here down to 500 feet in Detroit. On a clear day, you truly can, from up by the high school, the old high school hillside where the water tower is, you can see Detroit and the skyscrapers. We could always do that as a kid. There's a little bit more pollution now. Uh, also out on Seven Mile where the psychiatric hospital is, if you went on top of the top floor of the psychiatric hospital, no question, that is the second high point in Wayne County. They're about the same. You can see Detroit. So we talked about that. We talked about the early settlers. We'll talk a little bit more about that tonight. The naming of Northville, the North Village, you know, in this big township between Plymouth and Northville. And there was Phoenix in there and Meads Mill and, and other towns but we were the North Village back then. We talked about how Mr. Dunlap thought, could it be Dunlapville, his daughter? No, that didn't sound very good, the North Village. So we talked a little bit about that, the early years and the surroundings. My father, as we talked before, has been around a long time. He's going on 99 years old now. Uh, so he has lived the stories. He was 96 last week. 98 last week, he's going on 99. <laughs> I know, he ages really well. But, uh, his birthday was a couple weeks ago on October 7th, uh, 98 years old. And that's really the most important thing. He is the color commentary because he has lived the history. I'm kind of your play-by-play -play to answer questions, but he's truly lived the history and knows it from his perspective. Um, what else? Well, we're getting there. We talked a little bit where he grew up on Fairbrook Street, 222 Fairbrook Street. The water came right up to that point where Seven Mile is below, and we're going to answer that question where the big Balboa Lake was, where Ambler Pond was. Right on the other side of his house, he could put the canoe in and go canoeing right across the street. The other house here was my mother's house on uh, Dunlap and High Street. That's where the original OLV services were held by... Uh, priests that would come once a month before they built the church, and they were one of the families that built the Clapboard Church, and my parents 
for one of the hundred families that built OLB as it was uh, as it is today. Pardon me. So that gives you a couple perspectives. We talked a little bit more. The old Ambler Hotel uh, downtown that is on Center Street or Sheldon and Main Street. No longer on that corner. That is the southwest corner, and that's the old fire department behind with the, the bell in there. So the library, for your perspective, is here. So you are in the middle of the street on Center Street and Main looking west. Talked about the streetcars and the dirt roads in Northville, the way it was when there was horse and buggies. And then we talked a little bit about Wall Lake. Wall Lake was a happening place in the day. Um, going way back, we talked about the Indians in this area, about 10,000 Indians in southeastern Michigan, a lot of Huron tribe. Uh, they never quite figured out, but around Wall Lake is made name because there's literally a wall down there in the water all the way around when the water was probably less than it is today. They don't know who built it. It goes back as far pre-Indians, and they found some copper uh, arrowheads and other things. They don't know exactly who built the wall, uh, to my knowledge, but that's why it's walled lake. There's a wall all the way around, and there's still remnants in the lake itself today. Probably most of them taken out so you can get your boats in and out, but at one time that was on the edge of that. But in the later years, my father talked a little bit about that was the place in the 30s and 40s, the big bands, Tommy Dorsey, and you know everybody would be out there. My parents would go dancing. They had speedboat rides. They had uh, a huge hotel. They also had... Are you in that? I am not in that picture, but when I was a kid, you know, the big, the Ferris wheel and the roller coaster were still remnants of those days. That it wasn't active in the '60s when I grew up. But the dance floors you can see up there in the lake, it was a place. And my dad talked all about uh, stories about that. Um, again, we talked across from his street, Balboa Lake, Ambler Pond, uh, used to be right there on Seven Mile. Uh, west of uh, Shelton there. And different homes in town, the old Chase Mansion, which is still there today on Griswold and Eight Mile Industrialist. There used to be a larger home there, and it burned down because they had Spanish moss in for the uh, insulation. It caught fire one night and goes pretty quick. Um, this is East Lawn. The, the top of this, that was an old mansion on Buckner Hill, uh, Mr. Buckner. Later on, they made it a sanitarium. That is on the top of the hill where Hill Hillside um, Junior High is, or middle school, this side of the swim club. That was still there in the 70s when I used to cut through there, and it was a uh, center for a convalescent center after, later on. It was a sanitarium for TV and other things at, early on. We talked about the ski jump hill. And we'll talk about where that is, because that was a question. The North Electric Shop, where I didn't mention, going back, the history of the Turnbulls in town. And my dad's parents are in this book and on the cover. A hundred years ago, at the turn of 1900, my father's parents, my father's dad, my grandfather, was the electrician in Northville. Where Baby Baby is uh, today, that was the North Electric Shop. The first North, North Electric shop is on the latest History of Northville book, which was right there on Main Street. And he told a little story about why it moved down the street. When Dillinger came to town, that was a hardware, and he kicked in the door and stole everything. My grandfather had a couple dollars, and he bought the building. It's called the Ware Building today. That's where Baby Baby is. So they wired basically all the homes between here and Williamston. They had another shop. So all the original wiring of the old farms was done by the North Electric Shop. His father and my dad grew up in that business, and we as kids. And on the other side, my mother's father was the barber in Northville, in downtown. So, and there's pictures, and we showed a couple of that. In that alley downtown, you can see it says bowling, and in that bowling was his barber shop. And he lived on, two, on, between, on High Street and Dunlap, that we showed that picture. So, we have it from both sides of, of the family. So I've grown up with the folklore and the story. Again, I'm play-by-play. Play. My dad will give you all the colorful stories here, but I just wanted to bring you up to speed on last week. 
We talked about the mills, all the towns around here. What did you have to have in town? But really, you had a mill to begin with to do your corn and do other things. So Northville and Phoenix and Meads Mill, where Meads Mill School is, that was a, t a town as large as Northville. But what didn't it have? Does anybody remember? It didn't have a church, so it didn't last. Okay. Um, so questions from last week. Now, so you went through an hour and 15 minutes and about three minutes there. Questions that came up, the Ford-Firestone relationship. We talked about Henry Ford being in town, and we're going to talk in some detail in the future on that. The Fords, Henry Ford's son was Etzel Ford. Etzel Ford had two sons, William Clay and Henry Ford II, the Dukes. Um, three. Benson. Oh, Benson, okay. But, but you see where I, I got mixed up in my story. I used to work for Etzel Ford II, so that was in my mind. Um, the Firestone Connection is where I'm getting to. The Firestone Connection, William Clay Ford married a Firestone. And when you go to Greenfield Village, you will see a Firestone farm. Why, that is um, Henry Ford. Henry Ford's son was who? <coughs> Etzel. And one of Etzel's son is William Clay. William Clay Ford Sr., who passed away, whose wife still owns Martha, owns the Lions. She is Martha Firestone Ford. So that's, I, I had Etzel on my mind because I worked for Mr. Ford down at Ford Credit at that one. I'm an old Ford guy, you know, good, good or bad. So that should answer a question that somebody said, I got going down the Etzel line, you know, versus uh, William Clay. I know it, but I got excited. Uh, also, last week I had a microphone. I think I'm loud enough. Can you hear me back there without a microphone? Because it was kind of too loud, I, I believe, because we have to bring up the mic pretty loud for my father. Um, where was the ski hill? I think we talked about that, but again, somebody asked me. The ski hill in Northville was, it was the capital of the ski hills. They did Olympic trials here. They had some records here. It was a big deal. My father talked all about that. We'll talk a little bit next week, but where was it was the question. As you leave Northville Downs and you go towards Hines Drive, the parkway, Right on that corner where Seven Mile goes to the left, down towards the party store where McDonald Ford used to be, that, that is the runway where they landed. If you're right on that intersection where the parkway starts and Seven Mile towards going east towards the party store, this side of the racetrack, that hill to your right, on top of that hill, that's where the platform was built, you know, about a 75-foot platform. And they came down that, and that's, if you ever look, that's a pretty straight runway between that piece all the way to Seven Mile, where McDonald Ford used to, and where the fitness center is today, whatever that they call it. That was where the hill was. So if, hopefully that answers a couple of the, the questions that they had in here. Um, are the downtown streets the same width? Optical illusion. We showed a lot of pictures. Somebody said, oh. These streets look so wide at the beginning, you know, they must have moved the building. They did not move the buildings, but the optical illusion is, at one time on Main Street, it was parallel parking. So it still looked pretty wide, and then they had diagonal parking, so that takes a little bit of the space. So if you look in some of these pictures, you'll see next week, we're going to show a movie of the 100th anniversary parade that is in 1928, and it'll show all the streets. It was somebody with a hand-to-hand, -hand, and my dad got a disc of that, and the Historical Society has it. It is a great film, and we put it to music in the whole bit. You will see all the streets in downtown, and you'll see Civil War vets marching in the whole bit. So, um, another question, where was the perimeter of Balboa Lake? So the lake that we talked about uh, where my father grew up on 222 Fairbrook, which is down past the post office. If you keep going down that street and take a right, Balboa Lake started, let's do this easy for you, Norfolk Downs, you're sitting in the middle of the intersection of Sheldon or Center Street and Seven Mile, looking west towards South Lyon. If you go past, just past the road where 
St. Lawrence Estates is today. And St. Lawrence Estates used to be the winter barns for Norfolk Downs. You know, many of you don't know that, but I remember the horses going back and forth. Just past that street, you will see now that the leaves are coming down, there's a huge dirt dike that comes on either side that they cut the road through there. You'll see it more, once the winter hits, you'll see all the leaves down. If you go another couple hundred yards, you'll see the back side of the dike as you get up to closer to the gas station, which is now a repair center on Rogers and some, I go back to so many businesses there, but you will be able to see that come winter here and come in a, a couple weeks when all the leaves come down, but it's tough in the summer to see with all the leaves. So that's the two parameters. On the right side, Fairbrook Street, look to your right, it goes up really steep. That's where my father used to live and put his canoe, and it would go right down right, right to the, the lake, and that lake would go all the way to uh, Rural Hill Cemetery in the back. There's a huge steep uh, pitch to that, to the bridge going into Rural Hill. If you ever see, my father talked about how high that bridge is, because the water was right up to that bridge, almost to the top in the old days. So that was Balboa Lake, or Lover's Lane, originally Ambler's Pond. Uh, Henry Ford helped build that dike all the way around and put a little railroad that went around to move all the, the dirt around. And his workers, after they completed it, put some dynamite in there to get all the fish that he stocked in there. Mm. And it cracked the dike, and after a few years, oh. the water came out, and thus oh. that, that's where it is. So uh, I believe that's all the questions from last week, so we'll get to the color commentary now. So. <laughs> And somebody just asked me a couple others. Why was Norfolk chosen the site? Oh, and I'll have my dad answer a little bit of this too. Yeah, so the question is, why did we have all these city of Detroit activities out here? We had a sanitarium, we had prisons, you know, we had, what do they have, the hospitals, et cetera, the correction facility. Why, would you like to start that? Why did we have all these? Uh, now? Yes, now would be a good time. Um, in the early days, Southern Mile Road, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> Southern Mile Road was the longest paved highway in Michigan. It started at Lake St. Clair and ended up at Mayberry Tuberculosis Sanitarium. Uh, all the other roads coming out of Detroit were muddy. It was so muddy in the springtime they couldn't even drive through it. So that was one of the reasons uh, that North Hill was chosen. It was easy to get here. It was the only paved road to get out of Detroit. Uh, well, it's, there's another paved road going to Pontiac called Woodard Avenue. But the only road going west was Seven Mile Road. So that's where a lot of things happened in Northville because people could get out here. Uh, and of course, with the May Mayberry Sanatorium, well, that, that's, that's why that was chosen also, because people could get out here. But that's another story. And just to add to that, too, envision Wayne County. This was pretty far out. This was clean air. This was the country. This is kind of the end of Wayne County, and it was cheaper land than being in the city. So city of Detroit had all that land where Dehoko was off of, you know, between five mile and six mile, and, and uh, correctional facility for women, the Scott Correctional Facility, um, Mayberry Sanitarium, huge place. You know, when I was a kid, the big gates were out there, as my father mentioned, on Seven Mile and Beck Road, that was the main entrance, and we'll get a story about that next week, but had the huge gate, Mayberry Sanitarium, because Seven Mile was paved right to that coming out. So a lot of land, this was the country. You know, it's still kind of the sticks to some, but not really. Um, but in the day, Detroit, it's Wayne County, and Wayne County came out here and bought this land. So that besides being easy to get to, and Seven Mile was the longest paved road at one time, I, I believe, in the state, the locality, clean air, good air out here in the country. So hopefully that answers 
somebody's question. And the last question we had from last week, is this okay that we answer the questions like this? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, the last question that somebody asked me just tonight as it came in, we'll try to answer them the next time, but I'll answer this one. The well down on Northville Road as you come in. Somebody said, well, that's not really well water anymore, is it? Absolutely it's well water. It was always the well, it went dry for a while. And then a lot of people would come out from Detroit to fill up their, their water, uh, you know, their gallon jugs, there for a little bit because of costs and drilling a new well, it was Detroit City water. Because people would, they would come out from Detroit to get their own water and bring it back. That was just for a small time. It's been recapped and redrilled a couple times. That is purely uh, well water from Northville down in the springs. You can see as you go out to Highland Lakes, you go down far enough and the aquifers are down there. Very good water, in fact. The second part of that question was did they make pop down there or anything? They had Silver Springs water. They called that Silver Springs. All the trains that came through here, which was a big deal, served Northville Silver Springs water. And my dad <laughs> will talk about, about that in another session. But And they made orange pop out of that water. So anything you want to mention about Silver Springs? There was a question about the water. Was it truly Northville spring water? I mean, an hour later. You can answer it right now. The water. The water now. Now. Talk about the well going dry. Yes. Yes, and going dry. You can talk about that. Um, if you're talking about people hooking up with the Detroit City water. Yes. You're talking yes. about that. Yes, but you can tell more. It's more colorful yeah. from you. <laughs> well, it, it really is a Silver Springs water now. But uh, the Rotary Club drilled a well and, and it went down about 60 feet. And so uh, there's a pump in a the well there right now made by the Rotary Club. And, and if it quits running, they go and put another motor on there and put another uh, motor down in the hole so the water starts running. So when people come out from Detroit or anywhere else or Northville and they want Silver Springs water, they, they are getting the real Silver Springs water. But like Brian was saying, when it quit, they hooked it up with the Detroit water. <laughs> so people would come from Detroit to Northville to get a jug of Detroit water and then go back to Detroit. True story. Went with the water and they'd say, oh, this is the best water I've ever had. This is Silver Springs water from Northville, Michigan. Well, they didn't realize it, but it was Detroit water uh, came in from Lake St. Clair from down in Lake St. Clair. But anyhow, but it, it is the real Silver Springs water now, and, and that started uh, back in, in the 20s, and it was, it's been running ever since, and it's still running right now. One last thing that somebody came to my house, a couple of people called, a week ago at the same time there was a meeting to see what to do with this house, which is over there by the early bird on the other side of the um, Presbyterian Church, you know, over there. That is an old historic inn boarding house, but people wanted to know why Bruce wasn't there, I wasn't there to talk about, we were here, you know, this is more important to be with you. Um, this was part of, they had a gold cure uh, house on Main Street, and what is gold cure? People came to Northville from all over the state and the country to get cured by gold pills for addictions. You had drug addictions, you had alcoholism, what have you. So they would have treatments for weeks at a time during the day, and this house is on Main Street today on the other side of where the old village school is and what have you. We'll talk about that next week. Um, this was the boarding house for the people that came to the gold cure. This house also dates back to the Civil War era. It, it was a boarding house and a hotel back then, and a, somebody's home that, that we'll talk in the future. But today, they are looking to take that down. It was voted to take that home down. The only thing, my opinion, because I'm opinionated sometimes, 
you can't rebuild something again once you take it down, you know. So our opinion, my opinion would be, it would be great to do something with it. The Historical Society doesn't have any more room in the mill race. Could that be a, a museum for Nor North Valley doesn't have a museum. I don't know the answer, but I'm just answering the question about that. Somebody said, why weren't you there? We weren't there because we were here, you know, a week ago. So to me, it does have significant importance for the, the Norfolk era back to the Civil War. It does have a long history. What will happen? I don't know. I'm sure there'll be editorials to the record, you know, if we read that anymore and other activities. But if you have, I didn't mean that negatively, if, uh, if you have any opinions on that, this would be the time to voice them because I believe it was voted last week to come down. Can it be stopped? I don't know, but I'm just answering the question that a few of you had that called me after last session. And we went through the same thing. This is a 1970s article in the Norfolk Record with that same house in the background talking about they're tearing down some homes in Norfolk. Should we start moving them? Thus the mill race started getting more homes in Colbert. So it's ironic the same home, this is a paper in 1974-75 talking about what they're going to do with some of the old homes in Northville. Is that on the south side of Main Street? This is on yeah. the north side of Main Street, on, on the, the same north. side as... Oh, it's the restaurant you said. Early. Early yeah. Oh, yeah, it's on the north side. Okay. If you're at the Early Bird, you go into yeah. the Early Bird parking yeah. lot, it's on your right, or the yeah. east side. It's across the street from Starbucks. Yeah, it was a bedspread place there when we were younger in Northville. It was a hotel, of course, way before that it was a hotel. It, somebody had an, an art studio in there, uh, so that is it. It's, it's kind of salmon colored, you know, today. Sorry, we went a little long on that, but I tried to answer all the questions that people had. So today, we'll talk about lumbering briefly in Northville, early roads, my dad will do stories about sports parks and why Northville Grew will try to get you out of here before the World Series starts. Um, just a couple things we talked about last week. If you want more information on Northville, the library has so many resources and great books and Wendy in the back. Wendy, can you wave your, wave your hand again who introduced us and was very gracious to ask my dad to, to come in and talk about these things. Hoffman's book is a great book for the first hundred years of Northville. And next week you're going to see the parade for the first hundred years, and we'll go through some of that. It's kind of interesting, you know, I, I believe. That's a great book. My dad has been on walking tours and has been part of writing books in Northville. Um, there's a lot of resources. See Wendy. There's a whole room dedicated to it. So if you have more questions, you want to get into it, the library has resources, the Historical Society, you know, in the mill race, those are historical buildings. They will be glad to give you more documented information. Today, it's really the stories and people, my dad, who lived it, is I think is pretty important. Inside, why I mentioned this book, too, inside the cover is an old map, and around the map, not important that you can see it, but from my standpoint, it says, uh, plains and heavily timbered area. I mean, everything in Livonia was timbered. You know, I mean, the, these were trees out there. This is an early 1800s one. So that's in this book. The next one, they start sub that we talked about last week to the North Village and subdividing it out. This was Mr. Dunlap, his first plat of uh, plotting out Northville in downtown. And on this map, why I put it up there, you can see Northville way up on top there. This is Plymouth down here. In between, you have Waterford, which is a pretty big town, which is Meads Mill. The Meads brothers had a mill, thus you go by Meads Mill and the school of Meads Mill. If you go down there today, you still have a lot of the homes and different remnants when it was a town, but what did it have? Church. Church. <laughs> and Phoenix is between Waterford and Plymouth, and that had a mill and, and a whole town too. So that's in the book. If you have more, have time and want to go through things, it's in there. We can't cover everything. We're trying to get through a lot of information. Um, again, another plot of that same Norfolk area. This just gives you an idea. Town, why is Norfolk special? Of course, we think it's pretty special. My dad's 98 years, my 57 years, um, and I'm the youngest of all the Turnbulls. 
But downtown is really the same, basically, as it was in the eight, eight, late 1880s or, or so. Yes, there's a fire on one side, but it is a touch point. You know, it is something that if you were here 100 years ago, which you'll see the parade, it's almost exactly the same as it is today. And you can see the progression, you know, to the Model A's and, you know, the, the buildings that you still know today to in the 50s there. So it's, and that's the old opera house. We're going to talk about that. This is down Center Street. So this gives you a couple different viewpoints. Now we're starting into some new material. Norfolk had an awful lot of maple trees. In fact, where we live, an Eaton Drive over by the Catholic Church, we have the largest maple in Norfolk. It is probably eight foot across uh, on the, the trunk. They used to tap an awful lot of the trees around Northville. In fact, the, the Bloom Forest, which is up by where OLD basically is today, was all maple trees up in that area. And they had a, a huge area that they made maple syrup. And they would tap the different trees. And this was recently, and this was an uh, article uh, a while ago talking about tapping. And with that, why don't you start telling the story about how you uh, tapped different trees and had a little of the story and the maple trees. I just went to sleep. <laughs> <laughs> Do another. <laughs> Brian did a good job there bringing up to date what went on. But uh, when I was a, a young boy, I was about 14 years of age, we had a bunch of maple trees uh, right down uh, East, um, <coughs> Fairbrook Street. And so I asked all the neighbors, can I tap your trees for syrup? And they said, sure, Bruce, go ahead and do it. So I went up over to the hardware store and I got some of them under all the plugs. And I took a hammer and I, I, I got a, a six trees that I put the plugs in. And then you hang a, a pail on the plug. And, and then the, the water starts dripping in that. And I said to my mother, uh, she had an old kerosene stove in the basement. I said, can I use your kerosene stove to, to cook my, my syrup, my sap, to make some, some maple syrup? And she said, sure, go ahead. <laughs> so I went and got a gallon of kerosene and put it in the stove, and, and the thing went day and night and day and night. And the, every, every day I'd go over there and get the pails and carry the pails back and put it in the, in the basement. And, I, I think after all, all my work, uh, I got less than a gallon of syrup. <laughs> I, I think it takes 55 pails of syrup, or 55 pails of sap to get one, one gallon of, 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 yeah. of maple syrup. I might be wrong in that. But anyhow, that, that was my deal to make a maple syrup. <laughs> but, uh, it was a lot of fun, but after one year, <laughs> Another story my father will talk about the early mail in Northville. Early on, and this picture is by the way where the fish hatchery park is today. When I was a kid, it was still the remnants of the fish hatchery with all the, the lanes where they put fish. Mr. Clark, you know, of Clarkston came here and was very famous in raising fish. But so that that house is still there. That is the superintendent's house on the opposite side of where the fish hatchery is today. And this barn is still there. I think they're selling this house on the corner of Orchard and Seven Miles. So to my knowledge, this just gives you an idea. Horse and buggies were all around. In downtown Northville, the mail started, I believe I read, in about 19, 19, 1832. And once a week, a stagecoach would come into town, you know, having eight to ten people in it, and the mailbags would be on there. It was this kind of stagecoach that they would get the mail and then sort it out in Norfolk. So that was phase one of the mail. Phase two, why don't you tell them about the train and the mailbag? Um, there was a man in Northville named Mr. Perrin, and he had a contract uh, with the Northville Post Office. Uh, every day he'd go over to the post office and they had a bag of mail 
and he, he'd take, take it in his car and he'd go down to the railroad track and this, and I, I think the hook is still there, and he would take the bag and he would hang it on the hook right beside the railroad track. Hmm. The trains would come through north at about 50 to 60 miles an hour, and the fellow had a pole, and he would take this pole and, and reach out and grab that bag of mail and keep on going, and never have to bother to stop. So Mr. Parent uh, went on vacation, and he had a son named Elmer Parent, and, he, and so he said, uh, Elmer, that was his son, will you go down to the post office and uh, pick up the mail and take the mail bag down and hang it on the hook by the railroad. So uh, Elmer said yes. Uh, Elmer later on became a, an executive at Dow Chemical. Mm -hmm. Anyhow, uh, so <coughs> Elmer was a friend of mine, so he said, Bruce, come on down, I gotta go get the mail in the, at the post office. So over we went mm -hmm. to the post office, grabbed this bag of mail, and it's in a, a cloth bag, and we took it down there, hung it on the hook and the train come flying by, and oh God, he made a mistake. And, and the, instead of hooking the, the bag, he hooked into the clock. And letters went all over. <laughs> Holy correct. So, Elmer and I, James, we went up and down the railroad tracks, picked up all the mail. And uh, of course, the bag was there too, because it was ripped open. So then we took all the mail and we could find, I think we found all of it, <laughs> and put it back in the mail bag and got on our bikes and took it back to the post office. And they said, what happened? <laughs> so I, I explained it, it wasn't our fault. Oh. It, it was a fellow on the train going by, he had a hook out there oh. and he hooked the wrong thing. But anyhow, so uh, huh. that, that, that was more or less of the deal on, on the mail bag in North <laughs> <laughs> and just so you know, the train station where we talked a little bit about where the well is today, the train station was on the other side of the tracks, right in that same vicinity, up high. We'll talk about when he went to Washington, D.C. on his senior trip in, next time uh, in this, but in the train station was right there on the opposite on side, the side, on the east side, side. because okay. the tracks, east side of the track would be the train station, the west side today is where the Norco well is. So if that gives you an idea. And again, we're here afterwards or just tell Wendy all the questions you have. We'll try to answer them at the beginning with, um, next time. Let's talk about the trolleys and you going up to Pontiac and even getting some ice cream. What would you like to first? Yes. In the early days in Northville, uh, the streetcars came into Northville. Uh, we had two different routes of coming into Northville. Uh, one route was Detroit to Dearborn to Wayne to Plymouth to Northville. <clears throat> the other route was Northville to Farmington and then Farmington right down the Grand River to downtown Detroit. Uh, they had a, a streetcar going into Detroit every hour on the hour. <laughs> and so they really had fast transportation. It would take about, a, it'd take about an hour to get downtown Detroit by streetcar. Uh, not only did the streetcar take passengers, uh, they had a hook down the back like a little train and then they would take milk, and they would take vegetables, and they would take a lot of things into Detroit besides the mail. And, and the streetcars were really elaborate. They had a bathroom on them. Uh, so in the early days, I had a grandmother lived in Pontiac. So my mother and my sister and my mother and, and 
my mother and my sister and me, we, we'd go downtown Northville, right on the four corners of Northville, by the crow's nest, uh, on the telegraph pole, there's a box there, and, and it had green lights and red light inside of it. So when when the streetcar would would come up Main Street up the by um, the light would turn uh, from red to green. So then we'd all clap, hey, here comes the streetcar. So then we'd all get, when we get on the streetcar, and, and we'd, we'd, we'd go down to Griswold, and then the streetcar would go over to Farmington. My mother would always say, well, when you get in Farmington, ask for a free transfer because then we could get a free transfer and then we could go from Farmington to Pontiac. And she emphasized the free. <laughs> <laughs> Anyhow, so then we'd visit Grandma all, all day long, and then we reverse it from all the way back, back to Farmington, and then back to North Hill. And the streetcars used to go up Griswold and stop, and then come up Main Street, and that's Griswold and Main Street right there. And like, like we said, the old Jim Spagnolia, who was an Italian, and he had a, a grocery store in North Hill, a sweet shop, and uh, uh, he, he said uh, on Halloween, why uh, the kids greased the track, I told you that last week, he greased, they greased the track, and the streetcar came up, went to stop, and never stopped, and went right off the track and knocked over the crow's nest. And then they never put the crow's nest back up. And old Jim Spagnoli says, I damn well those the kids. <laughs> they, they, they greased the track. It wasn't me. Oh. It was. <laughs> um, Is that building still standing? Is that the village workshop? It is in that same vicinity, but that is not the village workshop in that, but same concept, same area. <coughs> Did you want to talk about the, yeah, the Ambler Hotel and getting ice cream when your Aunt Pearl came to town? Uh, my, uh, that hotel was right on the corner there. Uh, and uh, she, my aunt worked in Detroit, and she'd come out uh, once a week, and she pick up my sister and me, and we'd go down to the Ambler Hotel and sit there on, on the old chairs, the, the regular uh, chairs that, that they have, have for an ice cream parlor with a round table and the metal chairs, and, and we'd have a, a, a nice dish of ice cream. In those days, uh, you had banana split, and you had sundaes, and you had sodas. Uh, they hadn't come up with malted milks yet. Uh, later on, and years later on, my, uh, Jim Spagnolia started selling malted milks. So us kids in high school, we'd say, hey, they got a new drink they just came out with called malted milk. Let's go down and have one. So we'd go down to Jim Spagnolia's and get a malted milk. First time any, any of us had ever had a malted milk. <laughs> okay, Brian? Yep, that is good. And that's another picture of the streetcars coming uh, in, into Northville. And again, a close up of one of the stations. And they have a trolley station, which Henry Ford, ironically, even though he was an uh, automotive magnet, would come into Northville. We talked a little bit about his relatives here, and we're going to talk a little bit more in the future sessions. but. He would ride the streetcar too. Pretty efficient. You know, streetcars would go 50, 55 miles an hour. My dad said you could get to Detroit in an hour. You had a lot of stops too. So it was very efficient. It's probably better mass transportation then than it is today. I wish you would. <laughs> the streetcar would go from Northville to Farmington. A man in, in Farmington had a dairy, just like Guernsey Dairy now, and he said, um, I will give you permission to cut across my property 
when they're going from Farmington Road to Grand River. And they said, oh, well that's nice, we don't have to go all the way up to Grand River and then take a right hand turn. Well, the thing is that he, the place that he gave him permission for it went right by his dairy. <laughs> and, and the thing was, he, he said, well, you go right by my dairy and then I'll have let you take my milk and take it into Detroit. Yeah, he was so shrewd that later on he became the, the governor of Michigan. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So he, he took a shortcut right across there, but he ended up in good shape. Yeah. Not only did he get his milk into Detroit by the streetcar, now, he also became the, the governor of the state of Michigan. And his home is still down there in the Farmington area. It was Governor Warner. 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 Wasn't it? Yeah. Warner, I, I believe. You know, I know I'm getting old, but I believe it's Governor Warner. You can still see that. It's kind of the historical area in Farmington. And as my father talked about the, the trolleys coming in, when they were building Highland Lakes, they uncovered a lot of the trolley tracks, which, remember, it went up Griswold there, and there's some old pictures, and another archive is, look at the Norfolk record, and go into some, I think you can see the archive pictures, and if you don't know how, see Wendy here in the <laughs> library, but it's pretty interesting, all these things kind of come together, the stories that my father tells and weaves in and out are all based on all the facts, he just happened to be there when they did these different things, so... With that, why don't we talk about the sports parks in town, as you remember them. In the early days, the Northville High School had no place to, for their sports. The teams used to dress. Do they know where the old the old, the old village school? Used school? To be? It's right on Main Street. Right yeah, old, Main where are we Street. here? Old Village School. This that was my dad's Street. high school. The old high school used to be right here. Right here. Well, that's not, in the early days, Same that wasn't here. built until 1929. No, excuse me, 1918. But, but all the schools were in that area, he can tell you. The old Union School and others, okay. all the schools were there. Now that one burned down. Yeah, uh, between Main Street and Katy, there's been three schools there. This parking lot out here. Go ahead, Mr. Turnbull. <laughs> Anyhow, uh, the team used to dress in the old high school, and then they would go down to the racetrack. In, 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 in the early days, in sports, they had, for the boys, they had baseball, basketball, and football. In the girls, they had one sport, basketball. Um, now, you got about the high school now, my dad, that I got a list this long of all the different sports that they have, which is great. But uh, during the first football games, uh, they had the football stadium right inside the circle from the racetrack. And that's what you're looking at right there. And they, they had no, no place to, to sit down, and they had a big rope about that big around in the rope on either side of the, of the football field, a hundred yards long. So as the team went up and down the field, the people would just walk up and down. So everybody was on the 50 yard line, <laughs> both sides. They just walk along and watch, watch the game. And that, that, that was the first football game. I'm talking about the, the North and High School sports, I'll just touch on this a little bit. Uh, in, in 1936, the, the boys uh, playing basketball, when they'd make a basket, the referee would blow the whistle and then they would stop and, they, and we'd, every, we'd walk back to the center of the field, the center of the field, to the center of the floor, and throw the ball up and tip it up and we'd start again. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so the scores in the boys basketball, uh, say we played Plymouth, it would be 24 to 26. Mm -hmm. 
because the time was all taken from walking back to the visiting floor. In 1937, the coach said, hey, Bruce, get yourself in shape because next year we're going to have a great racehorse basketball. I said to the coach, well, what, what's racehorse basketball? He said, you'll find out. He said, instead of walking back, he said, as soon as the basket is made, you'll start running back and forth and back and forth. And that's the way it is today. There's no stopping anymore. So right away the scores went like 65 to 70 and so forth. So that, that's the way the boys went. And so I, I had an opportunity to play the old way and play the new way. In the girls, with two tuberculosis sanatoriums in Northville, one called Mayberry and one called Eastlawn. Eastlawn was up here on the hill by, by Hillside School. And so that was a private sanitarium. And so, uh, of course, Mayberry was out on, on seventh, was between seven and eight mile road. But anyhow, so everything was tuberculosis. And the only way to cure tuberculosis was fresh air and sunshine. No other way to cure it. And so they're so concerned about the girls running up and down the floor, they're afraid the girls would get tuberculosis. So what they did, they took the gymnasium floor and they took it and put it in three sections. And there's six girls on the team. There'd be two on this end, two in the middle, and two on the end. And the, the ones on, on the right-hand side, they're the only ones that make a basket. <laughs> and what they would do, they're allowed one bounce. They'd take the ball, one bounce, and then they'd grab it, and then they had to pass it to the next section. And that section would say one bounce, and throw it to the other section. And, and that section would try to make a basket. And uh, Rita, my, 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 my wife, was a real good basketball player. Anyhow, so uh, she, that's the way she did her in her freshman year. The second year, my, they said, well, maybe we can only split it in half. So then we had three girls on one end and three girls on the other end. And, and the, the three girls, they, they could make the basket. Right at that time, they fought with a medicine called streptomycin, which cured tuberculosis. They got other medicines now. So then he said, hey, we got a cure for tuberculosis now. Let's let the girls run up and down the floor, just like the boys. So that's the way it is today with the, with the girls, up and down. In fact, sometimes the girls are so good that they could beat some of the boys' teams. They're, they're so good. But uh, in the Northville Gymnasium they had here, uh, they had a racetrack up above the floor, the gymnasium floor, so the kids could run wide open around the, up, they have to take some steps and stairs and go up to the, to the top about 10 or 15 feet up in the air and they had a racetrack around there that you could get up there and, and, and run wide open around the gymnasium, which was fine, but playing basketball, uh, you couldn't shoot from the corners because the track was in the way. <laughs> so now, if they got the gymnasium now, they, they squared it off, they, they took the track down. That is, in the old village school today, where he played basketball, there was a track above that. They have taken that down. Even when I was a kid, the old locker rooms were there, and we would play on that floor. But that is still there today in the old village school, which is where we down Main Street here. Okay, so, so, so the, the, next, the next athletic field was Heinz Parkway Drive. And they put Heinz Parkway Drive in, they put in tennis courts, 
uh, for the high school, for, for people, but the high school used them. They put in a wonderful baseball field, and they put down a football field. And when I was playing football for Northville High School, that's where we played football, down in Heinz Parkway Drive, uh, just beyond where the ski jump hill. <laughs> you go down there, and there, there's a road into the left. Oh, Pine Park where you drive. <laughs> Again, where you start the parkway, go down a few hundred yards on the left hand side. That big open area is still there. That is the field that he played on. So it has a little rest area there, one of those original rest areas. Behind there, I think the Norfolk Colts and what have you used to practice there later on too. But go ahead, Mr. Turner. There's no bleachers down there, but on the west side, it's a hill and it kind of sloped up. And so everybody sat on the hill and watched the football games. That was fine and dandy. Uh, the next football field was down here at Ford Field, uh, right, 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 by right, CVS Drugstore. You walk across the street, and right down there, not only did they have a new football field, they had lights. <laughs> People could play, go down there and watch a football game at night, and they had all the all the seats right in the bank, right right going down the steps, and that was, they're still there. Yep, they're all yeah, poured in cement. Seats when I was a kid, there. they were still there. They're still there today. When you walk down there on the, the wood walkway, look to your right and left, you can still see the poured cement uh, bleachers. A lot of dirt on them, but that's what he's talking about there. I, I was athletic director for uh, uh, Our Lady of Victory School. The first one. I, I, I said to the Catholic priest, I, I had three sons. Brian's been the youngest one. I had two more sons, older, and uh, two, three. Three more. Three. <laughs> four, four all together. <laughs> I've I forgotten usually. I said, Father, I said, I said, Father, we got to have sports in our Lady Victory School because they once get to high school they'll never have an opportunity even to make the team. He said, Bruce, we don't have enough money to hire anybody. I said, I'll do it. He said, what's your charge? I said, free. He said, you're hired. <laughs> so for three years I, I was the, the football coach, I was the basketball coach. Uh, I, 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 I I even bought a station wagon. And my wife said, we don't need a station wagon. I said, yeah, we do. She said, why? I, gotta, I said, I got to haul, haul the team around in the station wagon. <laughs> Anyhow, I, I said to the athletic director of Northville High School, I said, I got a football team, but we don't have any games. I said, fix it up so we can have a football game underneath the lights. <laughs> down by the by the CBS drugstore at night, and his name was Al Jones, and Al said, "Okay, Bruce, I tell you what." He said, "Next week, on, on, uh, next Friday, we're playing Plymouth. Uh, the, the game starts at seven o'clock." He said, "You have your team down there at six o'clock, and uh, you, can, you will have a game against North Hills uh, seventh and, and eighth grade." team. I said, okay. So I, said, I think we had fifth graders, sixth graders, <laughs> seventh graders, and eighth graders. I know I had three of my boys on the team. <laughs> and uh, the youngest boy was a, he, he was a water boy. And my daughter, she, she was only three years old. She was a cheerleader. <laughs> so anyhow, we, we played the North Hills Public School, and the score was zero to zero. <laughs> and I, we're so proud. <laughs> half half of our Lady of Victory were down there <clears throat> watching the game. The, the biggest crowd they ever had. <laughs> and Al Jones said, Bruce, I don't know how come we had so many people watching the game. I said, they came to watch OLV play. So anyhow, so then, then from there, the next athletic field was up at, up at the high school, where, where they're playing right now. 
Kill so that, that, that was the last athletic field for the football, and they're still using that at the present time. I think that covers it pretty well. I think I, that covers it very well. And just to give you an idea, back that, my dad was the class president in 37 and captain of, there's the basketball team him in, in high school and football and baseball. My mother was the valedictorian of the class of 36, and she was the captain of the basketball team for, for that year. So, yes, sir. I got one more thing. I know you do. <laughs> my, my son, Michael, uh, which is the number two boy, he was a pretty husky boy. Uh, he made the Michigan State football team, which I, and I was so proud of him. So he, he was up in Michigan State. And he, 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 played, he went out there and as a freshman, and as a, and as a freshman, he made the fourth team. He walked on and made the team at, at the Michigan State. And the next year, he made the third team. They have four teams. And so he got beat up so badly, he said, hey, I, I've had enough of this. <laughs> so then the, when he got to be a junior, he got a job in the dorm to be a dorm manager. And he, he, they, he said, well, I said, how come they hired you to be the dorm manager? And he said, well, they, they wanted somebody to take care of the animals. <laughs> <laughs> so that, that's, what they, that's what they called the football team, the animals. I went up to, Mike, I, I went up to see Mike one day uh, when, when he was in the dorm manager. And uh, so, in, in the, the door going into where the amp, where the football team was, <laughs> I, uh, it was it was shattered. And I said, Mike, for crying out loud, what happened to the door? He said, mm, one of the football players had his had his girlfriend came in, in into the dorm, and she came in there to visit him. And so just for a mean trick, two of the football players, they're animals, <laughs> but they picked this girl up, took her over to the, to the toilet, turned her upside down, <gasps> put her head down in the toilet, no. and flushed it. <laughs> and the poor, the poor girl over here got down in the toilet, and so they, they brought her back up and set her on her feet, and she was so hysterical she started running down the dorm and went right, right through the glass door. Oh, and, you know, so a lot, of, a lot of things happened. And I was so, I was so happy that Mike made the football team. And I, I do think that starting at OLV, uh, that, that got him started. And of course, he made all league in, in high school and all that. But uh, anyhow. Good story. Um, we'll condense a little bit so you can get to the baseball game tonight. Two stories that my dad has left. One we talked about last week, the North Electric store used to be on one side of town across from where Bricks is today. That's on the latest North Pole history. Then they moved to where Baby Baby is today. That was the hardware that Dillinger came through town and broke in the back door. And even when I was a kid, they had a big metal plate on that door. You know, they didn't put a new door on it. They just replaced that piece of it. Um, there was another gang that was in town called the Purple Gang. And the Purple Gang, when I was a kid, we still golfed at Northville Golf Course. That was on Seven Mile and Newburgh. It's really Northville, where the hospital, Providence, Providence medical. yeah, medical facilities are today. There was a huge building, a dance floor and a clubhouse and a golf course around it. It was the place <laughs> as a, a casino nightclub in the 1920s. And Norfolk High School had some of their proms there in the 20s. It was the place. When I was a kid, well, a little bit older, we played golf, and it was Still the remnants there with the old mm -hmm. um, trees, the plastic palm trees, you know, uh, in the, the concourse and the big open dance floor. And my dad will tell you a little bit about the Purple Gang there. Yeah. Seven Mile and Newburgh Division. 
there was a, a gir young girl, she just came out of high school, and she was the secretary uh, for the Purple Gang. And they, uh, this is before, just before the Depression. And so uh, they paid her to be the secretary, and so she never put, him, put the money in the bank, because later on all the banks went broke, of course, and so she, she saved all the $20 bills and put them in a suitcase. And so, uh, she, she, uh, like Brian was saying, it was a beautiful old building. It would have been ideal for a movie, mm -hmm. because they had a wonderful dance floor there, and up until 1929, the North Hill High School had all their senior proms out there. They had palm trees, artificial palm trees, about eight or nine feet tall on either side of the dance floor. And they had beautiful doors. They would open up the doors right out, uh, outside. And it's just beautiful out there. And uh, when we were out there playing golf, I, the dance floor was still there, and the, and the trees were still there. And then the, they had all the old furniture, the wicker furniture, which is, is an antique at their great, and the old bathrooms upstairs and downstairs. Anyhow, so she kept saving all of her money. And so then uh, later on, when the Purple Gang uh, either got annihilated by the Dillingers, uh, or they're going to give it up. By, um, they're going to put the place up for sale. By the secretary, by that time, was about 50 years of age. And she said, I'd like to buy the building. <laughs> and they said, well, you don't have any money. She said, look at, look at this. So she opened up the suitcase. It was full of $20 bills. <laughs> and they said, hey. You're, it's yours. So they, they sold her the building. And so Frank, when Brian and I were playing golf out there, she was about 70 years of age. And so her name was Mary. And, and Mary had a boyfriend named Bob. And so uh, they lived right there and stayed right there. And we, when we used to play golf, she was about 70 or 75 years of age. But it was a beautiful old golf course. I, I know one day I was out there playing golf, and I, I, uh, the first hole is only out there about well, maybe 190 yards. And uh, so she said, Bruce, hit the ball. Hit it. And she had a window, and she said in the window, tell me what to do. And I said, hey, there's people on the green. And she said, hit it. And so I hit it, and the ball went right on the green. And there's a foursome on the green. And they hollered, hey, what are you trying to do? Well, I looked up at her, and she was gone. <laughs> <laughs> anyhow, so they, they blamed me, but anyhow, so we had some great times out there. And at one time, my, uh, my wife and I were going to invite them over for Thanksgiving dinner. She and Bob, but uh, I, I guess they didn't take baths that often. <laughs> so uh, they, they, they first they said we'd come to dinner with you, Bruce. And then they called. They said no. I guess we, guess we not. So they, they never came. Mm -hmm. But that that covers the pretty much so. Yeah. And again, it was like going back in time in the '70s. The, it was the same building, the same wicker furniture, the the same ballroom. It was quite something. If you were somebody that appreciated history, and I didn't as much as a kid, but I remember it because it was so unique. It was like looking at a movie back then. But we would golf there all the time. Again, Seven Mile in Newburgh, where the medical facility is today. It was an 18-hole golf course all around there. So it was it was pretty interesting back then. Um, and again, Dillinger was a, com a competitor. Last story, as Wendy mentioned, 
it's the Halloween season, and Halloween is big in Northville, isn't it? I mean, go down and down that. We live on Eaton Drive a few blocks away, and we get about four to 500 kids. They get about 1,200 to 1,600 kids, you know, two blocks away on Dunlap. But it is a great festivity. We have people over, and we just walk downtown and, and do different things because we live down here. My dad would like to talk about some of the years past Halloweens, your Halloween stories, sir. Prior to World War II, the boys in Northville were mean as can be. <laughs> At Halloween, they would go in gangs, 10 to 15 years in a gang, and they would run all over Northville doing damage, as much damage as they could do. They were so mean, sometimes they would go over to steps in, in a person's uh, house, and, and four of them would get a hold of the front door steps if they're wooden, and they'd yank them, and if they'd come loose, they'd take the steps right off. They'd take them down the street and throw them into somewhere else. The poor people would come out in the morning, <laughs> And they had to be so careful, they'd go to step up and there was any steps that they could fall and hurt themselves or even worse. Uh, it was so bad, uh, none of the girls went out at night. And, and of course on Halloween, Northville had two policemen. <laughs> One fellow's name was Cracky Like. He was just a skinny little guy and he had a limp. <laughs> so, uh, he, he uh, the sirens going all the while because people would be calling on the phone, hey, uh, this happened to my house, this happened to my house, and, and uh, the sirens were going all the while, and uh, of course the kids in gangs would run from one section of the North Hill to the other after they did the damage, and uh, they had bars, of, everybody had a bar of soap. They soap all the windows. If you left your car outside, your whole car was covered with soap windows. Uh, all the businesses downtown Northville, and we were in business at that time, were well, just solid covered with, with soap. You couldn't even see through the windows. You had to go out there in the morning and, and, and take all, get all the soap off which wasn't too bad, but sometimes they used wax, oh. a, a jar of, a bar of wax. The only way to get wax off is with a razor blade and scrape it off. But a, a couple of stories goes here. The, uh, one, one story by uh, Nor Northville in 1922 uh, started putting in un underground uh, toilets uh, the pipes for the, for the underground, uh, for the toilets. So everybody had an outhouse up to that time. So downtown in Northville, uh, for example, uh, they'd have one outhouse, and right on the outhouse it would say, Breeders Store, and on the other side it'd say, Northville Electric. So people knew that that, that one outhouse was for two different stores. And, 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 you know, and everybody had an outhouse in, in, in the yard. Uh, once they started putting in pipes for, for, out, for indoor bathrooms, by then they, they didn't use the outside toilets anymore. <clears throat> but lots of times the older men, uh, they like to use the outside uh, uh, bathrooms or the outhouses because if they're working in the garden, they didn't have to go in the house. <clears throat> this one old farmer in North Hill said, I'll be a gallantar and I'm not going to let them tip over my, my outhouse this year. Uh, so he got in there with a shotgun <laughs> and sat there on Halloween night. But the only trouble was he was a little bit hard of hearing. <laughs> So he sat in there with a shotgun with the door open a little bit. And, and so the, the, this gang of boys came by 
and they, they knew he, they, he was in there, so they snuck up on there, and they tipped it over with the door down. <laughs> How do you think he ever got out of there? <laughs> and, you know, so, 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 so. <laughs> I was too young for that. <laughs> I, I, I did have one little thing that I, uh, I, I said to, to my mother on um, Halloween night, uh, can I have a few eggs? <laughs> she said, uh, what do you want eggs for? I said, well, I just want a few eggs, please. <laughs> well, she said, the only eggs that are in the fridge to help herself. The, the boys would take eggs and set them aside and get them rotten. Oh. And then they go down to the doors and ring the doorbell, oh. and people come to the door and they fell them with, with rotten eggs. <laughs> and, you know, uh, anything is mean. At, at the Northville High School over here, uh, there's, a, there's a flagpole, and every Halloween, uh, some of the gangs of boys would take and, and hang some up, up on the flagpole. Uh, so everybody would, in the morning, we'd go out and say, well, I wonder what's hanging on the, on the flagpole today. They, sometimes they put a, a, a baby buggy, a, a, a little kid's baby buggy on there, and set the flag, and then they'd pull the chain and put it way up to the top. And the, the, anything crazy that they would hang it up on the, on the flagpole. That, so I, I, I said to my, to my friend Chuck Bish, Chuck Bishop, I said, I got some eggs. I said, let's go down the street on Fairbrook Street. There's a man named Mr. Priest. And I said, let's, we don't have any rotten eggs, but I said, I'll tell you what we're going to do. We're going to ring the doorbell, and when he comes to the door, we're going to throw the eggs at him. Mm. And uh, he said, okay. <laughs> so we rang the doorbell, and Mr. Priest came to the door with a shot. <laughs> and, then, and then he said, oh my God, Chuck, let's, let's, let's run. <laughs> so uh, we ran across the street. At that time, the pond was dry, but there's a big bank there. So we, we dove to go over the bank, and we're tumbling, and we're tumbling down that, down the steep hill, and just then the shotgun went boom. Oh. And I said to Chuck, "Are you hit?" <laughs> and he said, "I don't think so. Are you?" And I said, "I, I think maybe he, took, he shot up in the air." And I said, "Well, I don't know where he shot, but I got it." I said, we learned a lesson. We're, we're ne never going to throw any eggs anymore at Mr. Priest. So uh, I, I'm usually an angel, but <laughs> this is the same guy who greased the tracks. Remember on the trolley. But it, it's interesting to think before World War II, a lot of that Devil's Night activity would happen on Halloween. People didn't go out and collect candy. My father has said after World War II, mm -hmm. then they started collecting the candy and going door to door, according to his memory. And you can see the memories are pretty good and pretty distinct. But So it's changed a little bit after World War II. They started going out in the streets, and then they had times here in Norco. But before that, it was more like Devil's Night was um, Halloween. But uh, just some stories from the passing. We all have that coming up, and Norco has gone... Full tilt on Halloween, I think it, I call it Norman Rockwell's Halloween, you know, in Northville. It is a great activity. If you haven't been in Northville for Halloween, I'd highly suggest park your car downtown, walk up and down Dunlap Street. It's totally blocked off, and people are there. They're putting shows on in the front. You know, everybody is doing their home. It's almost like Disney World sometimes in, in some of those houses. So I would strongly suggest if you haven't been downtown for Halloween, do that. You know, even just walk a few blocks. It's, it's well worth it, in my opinion. I just got one more I'm sure you do, Mr. Turner. Uh, it struck Bishop and I. Uh, I said, let's, um, let's go out in my backyard. We had an old apple tree. I said, we'll get a bag of old 
rotten apples, <laughs> and they said uh, down on Fairburg Street, the lights were a long ways apart like they are now in some areas, and it was dark in front of our house. And there weren't too many cars going by, but I said, when the cars go by, let's take some of these rotten apples and we'll pelt these cars going by. Mm. He said, that's a good idea. <laughs> <laughs> so anyhow, so we, we waited quite a while and quite a while and finally a car came by, zoomed by, and we pelted them with, with old rotten apples. And uh, he said, hey, that's good. So the driver went down about 50 yards and, and stopped and said, I'm going to call the police. I don't know where you guys are, but I'm going to call the police. And uh, you know, I said to Chuck, oh, he'll never call the police. <laughs> Just then we heard the siren. <laughs> and here come Cracky Lake. <laughs> and he stopped right in front of our house, oh. 222 Fairbrook. And I said to Chuck, oh, my God, let's, let's run. So we ran out in the backyard uh, at 222 Fairbrook. And uh, I guess we we're real old, probably about 13. <laughs> and uh, we hid in the bushes, and out come Cracky Light with a flashlight. <laughs> luckily, he didn't find us. <laughs> but, uh, boy, we were scared to death. We said, hey, no no more of that. <laughs> just, just like Brian said, now Halloween is party night. <laughs> and and uh, at our house, where Brian and I live on Eaton Drive, why like cars come in from the country loaded with children. They, they have no place to go trick or treating. And, and the parents give them a big bag or, or, or an, an old, and they say, okay, honey, go, go get them. <laughs> so up and down the street. So we have, what, 100, 200 kids Stop 400. up and down our street. I give away full size candy bars so I know it. <laughs> And then, like Brian was saying, they close off Main Street all the way from downtown to the fire department all the way out to Rogers Street. And there's just hundreds and hundreds of people. And it's Halloween time, but it's party time, <laughs> and it, which is nice now. And little kids come up there all dressed up and, and, we, and then thicker trees, and we always give them a, a candy bar. Now, how many candy bars do you give out? About 400. Wow. We like the little kids, you know, we give them two sometimes. <laughs> so, very good. That's about all I do. Good. So from that standpoint, we can put the lights up. That gives you, we went a little bit late because we started with some of the questions before. Hopefully that answered some of your, your questions. Um, next week, we will talk about the growth in Northville and the, and the Centennial Parade. My dad has a slide presentation, about 20 slides of a lot of different things that happened. But I think one of the most interesting things is the video of the parade in 1927 when my dad was just a young kid and he's on the sidewalk there and his parents are in a float with a Model T truck, you know, for the North Electric Shop. You will see the streets and you'll see Civil War veterans marching. You'll see Indians marching in it. You'll see some stagecoaches. It was a big deal, the 100th celebration, kind of like Northville, in my opinion, in... 2027, that's the bicentennial of this community. That should be a huge deal, too. But uh, I appreciate your patience tonight. We went a little bit too long. Yes, sir. Is, 20, is next week the, we're doing the 20 slides? Yes, and the movie. Okay. Uh, my last, next week will be the 20 slides, and it'll be, be the slides of, of everything like uh, the fish hatchery. Uh, tuberculosis, Mayberry uh, tuberculosis, uh, uh, the ski jump hill, and then I, I, I've been to all those places, so we'll have a little talk, but I'll, I'll be doing most of the talking. Uh, it, it will be his show next time, and a lot of different stories, the Salem train wreck and other things, so thank you very much for your attention tonight. We'll see you